Hey everybody, Bobby Medina here with my very dear friend and compadre Paul Barron. And we are bringing you a very special interview with somebody uh, who I've heard of since I was a kid. You too, right, Paul? Yeah. And uh, he's a legend in the uh, trumpet world, originally from Dallas, Texas. He uh, earned his BM in trumpet performance from the Eastman School of Music. Uh, he has his master's degree in theory and composition from Ball State University. He is a former member of the Los Angeles Philharmonic, Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra, the Royal Ballet and American Ballet Theater, the Victoria Symphony, uh, the Canadian Broadcasting Company uh, in Vancouver, and has also recorded extensively for major motion pictures and television studios. Uh, he's also been a member of the Dallas and Milwaukee Symphonies, assistant principal of the Rochester Philharmonic, and first trumpet with the Marlboro Festival Orchestra, to name just a few. So welcome, Boyd Hood. Thank you for being with us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to uh, sharing as much as I can. Well, hi, Boyd. I, uh, hi, one of my uh, regrets, and uh, I, we talked about this before we started recording, was that uh, when you were, um, I, I think it was seven years you were in Victoria, um, mm -hmm. I never did get over there. I grew up in Vancouver, and I really uh -huh. should have gotten to Victoria to take a lesson, and I never did. So um, for, for me, my own interest stake, and everybody watching, I'd, I'd love to hear your story about how you got to Victoria and your time there, and then your transition um, down to uh, the L.A. Philharmonic and into the studio scene there. Okay, well... Uh, my third year at Ball State, I had finished my uh, master's degree in theory and composition while on the faculty there. And that spring, uh, a job opened at the University of Tennessee, uh, basically doing what I was doing at Ball State, you know, uh, the trumpet professor, the brass quintet, Knoxville Symphony. Uh, <clears throat> and I auditioned and was offered, you know, the position. And literally the next day, two very dear friends from school, George Corwin and Les Thimmick, uh, uh called me and said that there was a position open at uh, UVic uh, for a, a, a composer uh, in, in the uh, theory department. So that's the University of Victoria, just- University of Vic Victoria, yep. yes. And uh, so I went out and I interviewed for that and just really loved it. And I came back, discussed it with my wife and uh, we both said, well, I guess we're heading west. Uh, so I came to uh, uh, the university, and for two years, I was on the theory and composition faculty. Uh, I taught the first year theory course, the orchestration course, first two years of uh, uh, composition. And at the end of the second year, UVic was getting, uh, the uh, faculty was expanding. When I joined, there were six members on the faculty. I mean, a faculty meeting was, I don't know, what do you want to do? <laughs> <laughs> but as we expanded, uh, I, I had already started, uh, you know, a, a brass thing going at the university and was offered the option to either stay in theory and composition or move to performance. And so, no, I, I was just realizing that I was really a theory and composition geek, but my love was... Uh, you know, performance, the trumpet, uh, brass music, all of that. So uh, <clears throat> I moved into performance. And at the end of my uh, seventh year uh, in Victoria, in fact, I might mention that while I was in Victoria, I taught for seven years at the Courtney Youth Music Center, which was a wonderful uh, summer kind of camp that I think initially was uh, sponsored in some ways uh, by the Vancouver Symphony, but was under a Canada Council grant. It was. Uh, you're you're correct. I I taught there as a teacher's assistant a couple of summers. A great time up there. So I, I know it well. Yeah, it was really fun. Uh, so in my seventh year at university, I, I applied for a sabbatical leave, and we were thinking about where we would like to go. And I think it was in '76 that uh, the uh, L.A. Philharmonic came and played a concert at uh, uh, the Queen Elizabeth Hall. 
and uh, I met all the guys. I had, fr you know, friends, uh, Roger Bobo, uh, Ralph Sauer, we'd all been in school together. But I met Tom, Stevens, Mario, Guarnieri, uh, and everyone was talking about, uh, you know, Jimmy Stamp. And I'd heard about Jimmy, but uh, uh, that sort of, the more I talked to them, that sort of uh, seemed to be a logical thing to do with the sabbatical. Uh, to come to Los Angeles, uh, I got, uh, you know, and, and study with Jimmy. Uh, I had friends in the studios, I had friends in the Philharmonic, uh, and I'd seen a lot of friends go to Europe and, you know, come back with credit cards kind of maxed out. Huh. Uh, and I thought, well, uh, let's see how this might go because, uh, uh, one, we speak the language. So uh, it, it was just kind of one of those uh, ideas that came uh, you know, clearer as my wife and I talked about it. So I called Jimmy and uh, told him what I was planning on doing, applying for the sabbatical, and would he accept me as a student? And as you know, with Jimmy, he, he was just wonderful. Uh, he did. And so we came down in August of 1977. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, got settled in in a rent, you know, house that we were renting in Sherman Oaks. Um, and uh, Ray Kelly, who had been a colleague of mine at the Dallas Symphony, he and his uh, then wife, Jan, really helped us so much. Uh, <clears throat> uh, helped us find a place to live, uh, uh, and as, uh, as did Ralph and Linda Sauer. I mean, they were all just so great. Uh, and so one of the things that uh, initially, I started my lessons with uh, Jimmy, which I really enjoyed. And what I would do there is go in the uh, an hour early, because I, I remember Jimmy arrived at nine. My lesson was at 10. So I would watch him teach because I was on sabbatical. I wanted to really get as much of him as I could. So I would watch him teach an hour, then I, I would have my lesson and then stay for another lesson or two until lunch. Uh, and of course, we would play quartets there, you know, uh, and, and uh, that was uh, really uh, everything was starting to uh, really settle in with the lessons with uh, him. And at the same time, Ray uh, Kelly had invited me to go uh, to film calls with him because I told him I was interested in uh, seeing what that whole scene was like and did he think it was possible and he said sure you can come with me anytime and uh so i started going to film calls with ray and i met all of the all of the guys uh graham young george worth yuan racy the young malcolm um <clears throat> just so many people warren looning and great players yeah. and um on one of the uh, on one of the calls at CBS Radford, which became Todd A.O. here in town, um, uh, we walked in and uh, Ray went over to check, see what he was doing. And I sat down on the wall and uh, <clears throat> Ray came back and I said, so what are you doing? He said, well, it's a Wednesday night at the movies with a composer I've never worked with. So oh, really, who's that? He said, uh, Fred Carlin. I said, Fred Carlin? Well, I'd worked with Ray Wright and Fred Carlin at the Eastman School during the summertime. There was the Arrangers Workshop. And in the Arrangers Workshop, basically the Arrangers came in and they had, uh, as the lab, in the mornings we had an octet, trumpet, trombone, alto, tenor, berry, rhythm section, afternoon, a big band, four, four, five, and rhythm section. Last two weeks, it expanded to a studio orchestra. So I worked with Red for uh, with uh, Fred for a couple of summers, and uh, you know I, I thought Fred, and so I stood up and he was coming around the corner out of the booth and he looked and he said Red, I said Hey Fred, how are you doing? And so we talked briefly and he said Well, um, give Rich Vitrano his uh, copyist, give give Rich your phone number. Uh, I've, I've got to go to work here, and so uh, I gave Rich my you know. Uh, my phone number and went around and sat behind Graham Young uh, because Graham, you know, was really great. He would say, yo, okay, good, I just sit back over here, you know. And so I thought Fred and Meg and Donnie and I would get together and have supper or something. And two weeks later, uh, the phone rang and it was the service. 
and uh, said, Boyd, could you take a, a, a two o'clock single at MGM uh, on October? I think it was Monday, October the 10th, something around there. And I said, uh, yes. I, and she said, that's uh, great. Uh, it's with Fred Carlin. And it's the, uh, oh, what was it? The, uh, the Man from Atlantis. It was a science fiction TV show. And so I went out and I, and I got there early and I walked in. And uh, uh, Graham looked up. It was Graham and George Worth. Graham looked up and said, hey, Boyd, how are you? Come on in. We'll find you a chair, you know. And George Worth tapped Graham on the leg and he said, uh, Graham, I think that chair right next to you is Boyd's chair. And Graham looked and he said, hey, all right, come on in. Let's get you settled. Well, because I'd gone around to all the studio calls, it wasn't, oh, my God, who the heck is that guy? I, 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 you know, I knew Graham and, you know, as I said, I'd been on three or four, uh, uh, movie calls just sitting behind him. And so, uh, you know, I got settled in and the first big cue, I should say that sitting in front of us was, uh, 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 Dick Nash, Lord Ulie, George Roberts, Tommy Johnson. And then the horn section was, wow. was the Vince horn section. It was Vince, Rich Barisi, David Duke, Art Mavi. I mean, and I was just sitting there. I had to calm myself down because these are people that many I'd known since high school. Um, I, you know, on the old Capitol records or the Shorty Rogers records, you know, those. Uh, I knew that Graham was uh, Mancini's first call player. So... <clears throat> It was a matter of kind of calming myself down, Vince saying, no, this is what I, I love doing. Well, we did the first cue, which was a three-page uh, chase scene. And um, we rehearsed it. Uh, you know, Fred did the levels, first violin, second violin, et cetera, et cetera, all around the orchestra. Then we played it all together, and it was balanced. And Fred was so efficient. Man, we, we would go. Well, we put down the first chase scene, and I don't know what the look was like on my face, but uh, Graham turned to me and he said, it's going to be kind of hard to go back to Victoria, huh? And I said, oh, my God. <laughs> because I had forgotten what it was like to play on that level. I mean, I love the orchestra in Victoria is terrific, you know. Uh, uh, but when you're sitting in that kind of a setting with those players, uh, it was just such an extraordinary experience um, <clears throat> that I... Uh, uh, realize that, you know, I may have a, a decision to make here sometime, but I was still thinking about just, just sabbatical leave because we couldn't imagine leaving Victoria. We loved it so much. And we loved the faculty. We loved, I, I loved the orchestra. I was very involved, you know, in, in negotiating contracts and things with the, you know, the symphony. And it was just our life. They were so good. Uh, but that first studio call, you know, as I said, that that's playing on another level. I, it, it was like the first time I played extra with the L.A. Philharmonic. Uh, Molly second, I was playing first off stage and then assisting Tom on stage. That was that was another world. And uh, so after that call, I remember uh, coming home and then I next day I got another call from Fred for the man from you know, Atlantis the next week, um, <clears throat> I came home and I think my wife could tell that there was something going on, you know. Uh, and so she and I talked about it and, and she was wonderful. Uh, I sat down and I was just going on and on about the guys and what we were doing. And uh, she looked at me and she said, we're not going back, are we? <laughs> I said, oh gosh, but no, babe, we're going back, certainly. She said, we're not going back. We, uh, I, I'm going to have to find a job. There's a, an opening at the Buckley School that Ray and Jan had told her about. She said, I, I'll, I'll call them and see if I can interview. Uh, the Buckley School is a private school here in uh, uh, Sherman Oaks. And, uh, and I said, no, no, but I, you know, uh, let, let's just kind of think. I, she said, no, it's okay. Yeah, you'll, you'll do fine. I know you will do well. And my grandmother was staying with us at the time. She had come out. And I remember Mary, Donnie went out to start supper and Mary turned to me and said, she is really quite amazing, isn't she? And I said, yes, she's always been quite amazing. And um, 
So we saw it that whole fall. I started to work for Fred. I uh, played extra with the Philharmonic a couple of times. And I just felt at home doing that. And so Fred started using me. And about that time, he called uh, uh, Sandy, the Crescent. She was contracted at Universal. And uh, he uh, uh, told her about me and uh, said, would it be okay if Ford came over and, and watched you know, a session? And she said, of course. So I went over and I met Sandy. And uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was a Kojak that they were doing. And Joe Harnell did all the Kojaks, the Incredible Hulk, uh, the Magician, those TV shows. Mm -hmm. And that was where I met Warren Looney on one of one of the breaks. And so I, I met Sandy and, uh, you know, and, and Joe and, and had a great time. And it was like two or three weeks later, I was about to walk out the door around 10 or one, I had some answer and the phone rang and I thought, well, I'll let the service get it. And I thought, no. So I picked it up and it was the service. And uh, one of the girls said, I'm so glad you picked up. Can you take a one o'clock today at Universal? With wow. Sandy? And I said, yes, I, I, I might be a little late. She said, that's okay. Because uh, uh, she's going to start with a 10. Uh, a lot of the people who were on that date in the uh, afternoon were on a movie call, and Warren was one of them, on a movie call that suddenly had gotten held over, you know, for the extra hour. And so I came in, and uh, <clears throat> and it, uh, this is how I think small things work. Uh, got settled in. It was an incredible Hulk. And uh, so we did the first hour, and in the second hour, uh, we put down a cue, and... Uh, we were listening back, and uh, all of a sudden, Joe said, wait, 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 stop, stop. He said, Boyd, Boyd, yeah, uh, yeah, I said, yeah. He said, uh, in bar 46, why did you suddenly play so so softly? It's got to be forte there. I said, well, in the part, it says mezzo piano. He said, no, it's, it's forte. I said, well, it says mezzo piano. I'll change it. And he, and he came walking back, and he looked, and he said, it does say mezzo piano. He said, now that's paying attention to detail. And he looked at Sandy and went. And I, uh, I thought, okay, I guess that was a good, a good thing to do, just play the ink. And when I left, I, you know, I, I, I waved at Sandy and said, thank you very much. And he looked and he, I said, thank, thanks, Joe, it was great. He said, good job. Well, because of that one thing, I became Warren's kind of sub on those TV things. Uh, uh, because he was doing all of Joe Harnell's stuff. And, uh, but there were times when he would have a conflict, you know, Sandy had him on a big film. And so I just, uh, I, I just sort of began to work in that way. Uh, with Fred, I was playing for a variety of conductors uh, and I was playing for, you know, and composers, but also a variety of contractors. So I not only worked with uh, Lloyd Basham, who was, for that first part of that first year, Lloyd was uh, a, a, a contractor in town who was retiring. Uh, so then whatever Fred was doing kind of depended on the uh, production company. So I got to work for Carl Fortina at Paramount. Uh, started, I got to work for Marion Klein. Uh, I got to work for you know, uh, all the guys, Harry Lejewski at MGM, Mike Rubin. That's an incredible unfolding of events all within a one year because for some people it takes decades for them to get from that point a to point b you know this i know really and i just felt so fortunate and uh it, a lot of this uh, in fact all of it i felt was really due to fred that that he introduced me to some people i had chances to do things and uh uh you know often you know you think uh, why if, if what, what if I hadn't have picked up the phone, had gone out on errands, you know? Oh, yeah. That wouldn't have happened. And so it just, uh, as my dad used to say, whatever could have happened did. And the same thing happened. A, a good friend of mine was uh, <clears throat> Tex Balk, who was a wonderful horn player. Uh, and Tex played for, uh, he was working with the American Ballet Theater and the Royal Ballet, uh, working for Till De Palma. 
who was the contractor for the ballets back then. Well, te- uh, one night, Tex came over to have supper, uh, and uh, he was going to leave his bike uh, <clears throat> in the uh, uh, in in our garage. We had a closed off uh, driveway, and he said, "Can you take me down to the boat?" And then what I'll do is just uh, get a ride back here, and I'll, I'll just pick up the bike. I said, "Okay, I'll just leave the uh, gate, you know, unlocked, so you can get back in." And uh, so I went down, and I met Till De Palma, and and uh, we were talking, and uh, I I went to Eastman, and Till went to Curtis, and we, that kind of conversation. Well, uh, in December. Uh, uh, Tex called me and he said, Boyd, he said, I think Till, uh, Till is going to call you. He just called me and said that the, uh, both, uh, uh, the, uh, both of the conductors of the Royal Ballet and the American Ballet Theater who were coming in in the spring, they, they wanted all of the principal players to be there for the entire run. Uh, and uh, he, he said that Tony Flo, uh, Russ Kidd, and Malcolm can't can't do that, and so he called Tex and said, "Tex, is this something that Boyd can do?" And Tex said, "Yeah, that's right down his alley." And so Till called me and he said, uh, "You know, can you take this entire run on all of them?" And I, you know, I you know I said, "Yes, of course I can. I'll, I'll be happy to." And so that was where I I began to work with the Royal Ballet, Jack Lansbury and uh, the American Ballet Theory. It was just one of those lucky things for me because Tony and Russ were in the chamber orchestra, they were in the Pasadena Symphony, they were doing a lot of stuff. And uh, Malcolm was starting to, he was starting to work in the studios by that time. Uh, so he couldn't say, I'll take the whole run of uh, whatever. And so that that was very fortunate as well that I, uh, I got that opportunity and uh, you know, it just kind of worked out. And it was the next year that Tony and I were doing, I think it was in spring of uh, 79, we were doing the Bolshoi Ballet. And Tony said, uh, he said, Boyd, by the way, uh, cause he said, could you take a couple of students at USC? Tom uh, Tom Stevens, who had been doing it. Uh, he, he said, Tom is is uh, not gonna be, be there this year, he's starting, I guess they were still doing a lot of stuff with the new music and uh, Bob Duvall was thinking about retiring at some point. And so Tom was putting, you know, everything into the Philharmonic. And so that's how I started at USC. I I took a few students there. And then uh, it was one of those things that was unfortunate. Uh, John Kleiman, he was legendary, you know, the first trumpet at Fox and and everything. John uh, had always had heart problems. And he was a big guy, man. I mean, uh, but he uh, he uh, had a had a heart attack. Hmm. Uh, I think it was the year maybe eighty or 8, 81. It was before I joined the Philharmonic, and uh, uh, so I started doing more of the trumpet studio. And then Tony came to me. I think it was in eighty or eighty one, and said uh, he said, "Look, he said I'm uh, I, I want to do more with my solo career, and I can." I think he was going to play first trumpet in Malmo, Sweden, and he wanted to get I things. I saw him when he played trumpet in Malmo, Sweden. I remember that. Yeah, I yeah. Was Swedish and lived outside of that area. I had lived over there for a little while, so I remember. Uh-huh. I met him when I was in college, for just a moment. So yeah, yeah. He was a guy and a great player and composer too. Oh yeah, absolutely. And and he was doing a lot of composing here in town. Well, Tony and I got to know each other because he was on the faculty at Northridge. And I had played on the, he had written some trumpet ensembles and, and things. And I had, uh, you know, played on his recital there and, and helped him. I think I conducted a piece for him. Um, and so we had become friends and uh, we're, you know, now and then would, would uh, do film calls together or would do uh, uh, basically live things. So, uh, but at that time, uh, he then was only going to keep his students. He wasn't accepting freshmen or master students who were transferring. So uh, within a year or so, a year or two, uh, Tony was no longer on the faculty and I'd taken over the studio. Uh, and it was, uh, uh, you know, it was fine. I, I, I was doing the bulk of it. 
And then uh, uh, SC had, had always had uh, two or three teachers. So uh, Bob Wojcik uh, asked about, you know, he said, uh, I think it would be good to have, some, you know, for the students to have some, some options. And uh, that was when I, I uh, recommended Roy Poker uh, to uh, to Bob, and I'm sure that probably you know other you know and Bob asked other people like uh, Terry Cravens that Terry would have recommended Roy too. But I uh, Roy joined the faculty, but I was still doing the uh, you know kind of the uh, bulk of it. So that was kind of how everything just kind of worked in. So is this all uh, within the one year, or it uh, are we well, into this is all uh, uh, the first year? I started working for Fred and I kind of became uh, Warren's backup with Sandy. Uh, and then she used me on a couple of things on her own. That was in 77 that I, that began to happen. 78 was the American Ballet Theater, the Royal Ballet. So now you're officially moved uh, to LA by this point? Yeah, well, oh, okay. uh, Donnie and I talked about it. She interviewed for the job at Buckley and was offered the position. I mean, she was an incredibly beautiful girl. And she always would say, well, I went in and did my Dana Winter act, so they hired me. And I say, okay, pretty, but I'm sure it's a lot more than that. Uh, and she became the chairman of the English department there after a while. It was on the faculty for 23, 24 years before she became ill. Um, so she got a job on the faculty. Uh, she accepted it. Uh, and, you know, with the idea that if we did go back, then, uh, you know, obviously she could say, I'm, I'm not able to do it. But we decided to think about it. We were pretty sure that we were going to stay, but I wanted to think about it until the new year began. And by that point, we had gone to visit my sisters who were living in Colorado then. And when we came back, we both said, you know, we're good, because I'd gotten the offer for the Royal Ballet, American Ballet Theater. Both Tom Stevens, Roger Bobo, people kept saying, you know, if you stay in town, I think you'll do okay. And so I, I called the chairman of the department because I couldn't keep accepting the money from UVic. I was on you know, sabbatical leave, I think two thirds pay. And so I called uh, the uh, chairman and uh, the department and it was Rudolph Commerce who was doing it at that point. And Rudolph said, well, this is the phone call I've been dreading. I said, well, Rudolph, you know how much I love the university, you know how much I love the faculty, how committed I am to everything there. But there's a why in the road, and I've always dreamed of doing this. And uh, first of all, I cannot keep, you know, accepting the money from, uh, you know, uh, the university. And I wanted you to know right away. And, and he appreciated that. <laughs> so that you can start to look for someone and um, there was someone teaching there in, in the interim for me, but then they uh, uh, opened it up and that's when Louis Ranger uh, took the position. And uh, I, I think Louis retired from there now, but he was uh, both the, uh, you know, the trumpet professor and uh, head of the department for a while. And uh, from what, uh, uh, I, oh, Ed Birdwell told me that Louis's wife, I mean, uh, a few years ago, that Louis's wife is like the Dorothy DeLay of Canada now. That she's really quite uh, famous. So uh, I, I officially uh, uh, resigned from the university in January, and uh, uh, because and then suddenly that was the first time in my life that I had never had either an orchestra and or a university job. I'd never freelanced, you know, as a kid. But here I had, you know, we, we had an 11 and a seven year old. And uh, uh, I, I remember in May, my last studio call with Fred, I had nothing for the summer at all. Dawn was starting in September at Buckley. And I came home after the studio call and I was in one of my uh, yeah, 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 kind of moods. And I, I poured some bourbon, I was talking to her and I, you know, I was saying, pretty, I, I hope, God, I hope we haven't made a, a, a mistake. We, we have the whole summer, you know, and there's nothing. I have nothing in the books. I, I just hope it's going to be okay. And as she always did, she just sat and was looking at me with her uh, glass of Chardonnay. And finally, when I quit, she looked at me. And this is the best advice I ever got, in particular to the circumstance and 
as a general metaphor. She looked at me and she said, Boyd, we are walking across the Grand Canyon on a tightrope. Just don't look down and don't give up. That's Best great advice. advice. I, think yeah, awesome. I think that's incredible. You know, we all, I think a lot of us feel like that, that have been freelancers or started our own businesses or whatever, you know, it's yeah. our, our, our mind can get in the way sometimes. How, how about if we switch gears here, if you don't mind, this is that's so, so interesting to hear all these things and how your life has in, unfolded. Um, but for, let's talk about trumpet a little bit here specifically. Okay. There's, there's been some discussions in, in our group regarding, uh, Jimmy Stamp, you know, and uh -huh. myself as a former student, of uh -huh. his, I'm just curious to find out how you've used his principles in your teaching. I think it's so cool that you got to go observe other lessons you know, and watch what he did. I mean, you could have come to like two of mine and he had to pull out every trick in the book to get me out of my, <laughs> out of my slum. <laughs> but uh, anyways, I'd love to hear a little bit more uh, and and maybe you can give some advice on, on how to use, we can talk about a, just, a, you know, maybe one or two techniques that you feel people can mm -hmm. apply to their playing. Well, the first thing I found with uh, observing Jimmy's teaching was that he reminded me an awful lot of Emory Remington at the Eastman School, hmm. the great trombone professor there. Uh, Jimmy had his way of approaching things, as you well know. I mean, he would start with the lip buzzing, uh, and then you would play, you would start with mouthpiece playing. And then you would go to the trumpet and begin to play his uh, uh, exercises. And the thing that I found with his teaching was that it was very, uh, in a good way, uh, very simple. And by saying simple, it was very direct. There was nothing uncluttered in the way that Jimmy did things, as, as I know you know about. He I was very direct in how he dealt with it. He had ways of working with each student but it got back to the same place. And that was always getting you in the right spot on your, you know, on, on your face with your embouchure. Because uh, the, the thing with us is that we're artists, but we're also athletes. Um, we are doing the same thing here um, and with our lips that singers do. Uh, we, uh, brass players are the closest to singers. And uh, uh, that's always where that old idea of singing with your lips came from. And I think Jimmy even mentioned that a couple of times. Always that sense of, of lyricism in the playing. Um, and so the, the, the consistent things that I found were, one, <clears throat> that the lip buzzing, uh, he always started with that. Now, I found, I felt better I had designed with Merle Hireman uh, when I was in Milwaukee in 64, uh, a visualizer, because when I was studying with Herseth, he had recommended the larger mouthpiece. He played on a Queen on bass trumpet mouthpiece and the visualizer. And I had one, I didn't like the, you know, the normal visualizer. So we basically cut out the inside of a trumpet mouthpiece. And so that's how I did lip buzzing, but in lessons. And for that year, I worked with, you know, the lip buzzing, just, just see what the effects were, and they really helped. Uh, but we would start with the lip buzzing, then go to the mouthpiece, and everything would get set in the right way on the mouthpiece, um, and then go to the horn. And uh, one thing I'd realized as a student, and I heard Jimmy mentioning it to students as well, but when I was at Eastman, I would be doing mouthpiece playing, and sometimes I'd start to play the horn, and it just wasn't the same, something didn't, and finally, I think it was when I was a sophomore, I played a, a F concert on the mouthpiece out of my trumpet, and I thought, oh, that's a little bit different than I've been doing, and things got better, and that was one thing I noticed that, that Jimmy mentioned all the time to his students, to make sure the horn angle you know, was right. Uh, the thing there, too, was the, uh, the step um, that he drew, simply, he would say, um, uh, I asked him uh, one time, and uh, Malcolm and I have talked about this because he asked the same question. I, he said, uh, you know, I said, so what is the most important note? 
And he said, the most important note in a phrase is the note you're leaving. And that always made sense to me oh. because I always felt like the anacrusis should be long, uh, that the shape of the interior note should lead forward, but that you didn't leave the note too soon, either going up or going down, which of course led him to that very straightforward uh, stay up to go down, stay down to go up. Right. And it was so, the procedures were so direct, they were so clear, that then it was a matter of that you just breathe and uh, breathe and play. I mean, Jimmy uh, always had mentioned up and then play. Uh, my teacher, Mr. Resch in Dallas, who really formed my foundation when I was a kid, would say, suck back. So it was, it was essentially the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it was those simple, direct approaches to things that uh, uh, I've, I've carried into my teaching, both from my first teacher, Mr. Resch, to really my last teacher, uh, Jimmy. Uh, is that directed? Is is that basically that foundation? Because then you have something to build on, and that's uh, <clears throat> what what I call uh, uh, triggers. Uh, so I mean, I always they think of having the gum line, and then uh, ah and sigh, and then and just connect there to sound. Um, so that that uh, because we're in this incredible calibration device. And if uh, I, I think our main job is just to get the heck out of our way. And uh, if you have these triggers, those triggers are, are getting the calibration device to the endeavor. I mean, when you turn on a light, I don't want, I don't care about the switch and the lights and the wiring. I care if the light goes on. Well, it's the same thing with us. With these triggers, what you do in a very simple way is access the body in the most uh, beneficial way, in the most natural way for you. Uh, and this is what I saw in those triggers that Jimmy had uh, that they did for his students. Uh, and I know, Bobby, you, you had first firsthand knowledge with that because a lot of times he would say the same thing again and again. And that wasn't because the student couldn't remember. It's that you need those reminders because even practicing, you know, yeah, I, uh, you can forget him. He just had an uncanny way of bringing you back to your, what Paul and I call home base. Yes. And <clears throat> I was a young, brash uh, kid that had been playing in marching band and in drum and bugle corps. I was playing on the weekends in this polka band, and I was playing just way too much and way too loud and way too hard. And mm -hmm. I would, my lessons one semester were like on Tuesday or something like that, Wednesday maybe. And I just remember him asking me like, he'd call me his wounded soldier. And <laughs> my wounded soldier to be able to play. Cause sometimes when, when I had played really hard in the week, on the weekend, I wouldn't be able to play for a couple of days, literally oh, yeah. so hard. And what was just incredible about him that I've never experienced uh, on my own or with anyone since is that he could take me from my most trashed chops mm -hmm. to playing absolutely refined and feeling amazing mm -hmm. in a matter. And I'm not lying when I say this in a matter of maybe eight minutes, 10 minutes, yeah, I yeah. was going again as if nothing happened. And it was amazing. I mean, my first lesson with him was learning how to lip buzz and I had never experienced, I had airy tone, all that stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He totally cleared up my sound, got my, got me on the mouthpiece and uh, boy, he just changed the way I approached it and, and everything. And, and to, to this day, I do a little bit of, I find that I don't have to do nearly as much of it as I did back then. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll touch on it when things start to go awry. And of course, I'm aware of all of these triggers now and, and all those things help keep me in place, you know? Right. They um, really do. And they really keep, uh, Bobby, it keeps you, me, Paul, in the, in the right place for you. 
because our lip size, our teeth configuration, uh, the tongue size, the volume of area you have, the ability we have to move it out is different in every person. And what the mouthpiece practice does, it gives your body coordinated for your endeavor because, um, uh, you know, we've all seen it. Uh, there's no one way to do this. And yet there is a way that will get each individual back to the right way for them. And that's, that's what uh, uh, Jimmy always did. Uh, that's what I found that mouthpiece practice always did. And then getting the horn angle right. Right. Uh, uh, that you, you have these triggers. And uh, I'm the same way as you. I've gotten to a point that it, I don't always do as much on the mouthpiece in the morning. I, I do a bit, uh, the, the uh, alter horn mouthpiece, the visualizer. And then I, I usually have my cornet mouthpiece and my pick mouthpiece. And then I have a mouthpiece I use on the B flat and on C. And so I kind of use a different mouthpiece for each one of the things in my drill. Uh, or if I put together some of uh, Jimmy's things. Um, uh, and and uh, just by touching on each mouthpiece, I don't pick up the piccolo trumpet and think, ah, oh, it's been a while since I've done this. You know, it, it, it feels fine. Mm -hmm. And but you I warm think up on the mouthpieces in stages in different, with different, in uh, simultaneous, I'm not simultaneous, but one right after the other then? Uh, yeah, I start on the alto horn mouthpiece. Uh, that, as I said, I got from Herseth. Uh, and Herseth was like Sidney Mayer at the Eastman School. Bud never told you to, to do this or do that. He would mention things. And after my, uh, uh, well, I, I, I have a story in a second. After my first lesson, he said, okay, Red, uh, what I want you to do, uh, well, and that was back when I had a lot of hair and it was red. <laughs> um, he said, uh, I, want you, uh, I want you to get a, a mold made of your teeth. And I said, okay, um, I've been thinking about that. So um, uh, I'll, I'll see about that. He said, no, that's your assignment for the next lesson. So I went and did it. Um, and uh, every five or eight years afterwards, you know, I get it. Um, uh, but the second lesson, he said, uh, we talk on the porch. He said, okay, Red, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Uh, I'm gonna go downstairs and play on my big mouthpiece. Gotta play some work tonight. I thought, oh yeah, I've heard about that. Well, a month later or so, talking on the porch. Okay, Red, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. I gotta go downstairs and uh, uh, work, go play on my big mouthpiece. Got to play some Mozart tonight. So I got in the car and I thought, okay, that's two. And so I went and, and, and found the alto horn. And I found that starting on that with the Bach uh, number three, it's the Bach rim. It's something I'm used to. And there's no big change going to uh, the normal mouthpiece. But I do the big mouthpiece uh, first, and then I do the visualizer second. It's like the lip buzzing. And then with the rest, I'll, uh, you know, as I said, I'll, I'll do uh, some things on my uh, pick mouthpiece. Uh, I'll do some things on my, uh, if, if I was doing lead things at the bowl, I would, I would put in my lead mouthpiece, uh, you know, and then I'll do something on the mouthpiece I do use on the C. And then I always end with the mouthpiece I use on the B flat because that's how I start to warm up. I've told a lot, a, a lot of people, they said, well, I start on the C. I said, good. So reverse it, you know, do the last mouthpiece and thing you do on the C. And then that's kind of, I found it to be an efficient way of uh, putting it together. So this is uh, all still before you're uh, putting the mouthpiece in the horn, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so oh. then when I put it in the horn, I, I play an F concert uh, because with both Jimmy's drills and, and my mouthpiece drill, I found doing it on the B flat is better than doing it in concert pitch. Although I, I you know, I've had students who played the C all the time and felt it was okay to, to uh, do it in concert pitch. That didn't work as well for me. But if I play an F concert and then just add the trumpet while I'm playing an F concert on the mouthpiece, then I'm conduct, uh, connecting mouthpiece practice to the instrument. And then the trumpet becomes what it is, a glorified resonator. You know, it's a megaphone. Um, it simply resonates. That's why for me, I've never liked the term uh, buzzing because 
uh, you know, bees buzz, chainsaws buzz. Um, I always think of the sound I want on the mouthpiece, the sound I want on the visualizer, because our lips are vibrating. And it's that sound that the horn is going to amplify. So I, I want to connect the sound. So I'm always thinking sound. I, when I take a breath, um, it's not that I think, how do, how do I want to sound? I, it's like I have this idea in my mind of how I want to sound. Because if you take a breath and play, and you think, oh, that didn't sound too good. Well, it's a thousand years too late. If you take a breath and you have a clear picture in your mind of what you want to sound like, then the evaluation is, does the trumpet in the hands sound like the trumpet in the mind? So that you're making that connection because I've, I've always found with students, I don't often have them play a passage on the horn or play a passage on the uh, mouthpiece. What I have them do if we're working on pictures uh, it, and uh, pictures at an exhibition, if, 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 you know, we're talking style, well, gee, I, I'm not sure because I, I tend to do this here and I just say, okay, sing it. Here's the first pitch. And every time, and I think we're all this way, every time they do it, they interpret. And 99% of the time they sing it and they, they, they look at me and I just say, it sounded great to me, now play it that way. You know, because you're getting in touch with the artist. What we do with the mouthpiece practice before, we're in touch with the artist and the athlete. And we're getting the athlete, as Bobby so clearly said, uh, you get back to the right way for you right away. And um, it takes away the anxiety, even knowing that. And uh, Bobby, I'm sure you felt that same way, that even if it was a hard weekend, you knew that there was a way to get yourself back, not feeling like, oh my God, I'm trashed for the next two weeks uh, and and this and that's essentially what that what what that approach to starting on the mouthpiece does right and then uh, uh, basically I, I'm warmed up a lot of times I'll just go ahead and start playing uh, or I'll, I will tend to do what I did with Jimmy that spring was I was starting to work and in the fall I was still doing all of his stuff I mean I, I, I would spend a good day doing all the things, but that, then I began to realize, you know, I, I want something where I do some mouthpiece practice and I and do uh, his exercises because I really found them to be so helpful. And so I started combining the exercises. Um, at that time, we were working with da, 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 of course, mm -hmm. but he was always also working with da, 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 da. And then, ba, da, 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 which I liked a lot because it reminded me of a, uh, you know, a vocalist. My wife was a singer. And so I really liked that, that uh, idea. And so what I did was I combined, ba, da, 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 in C. And then, the scale, then the five seven, and then go down to B. Well, we started putting all this together, and after about two months, uh, it came up with uh, what I still give to students. Uh, there's part one and part two of uh, this combination of things, but I did it with Jimmy. Uh, in fact, the last time I saw him was at the Sportsman's Lodge. There was uh, we're honoring one of the guys, maybe Yuan, who was retiring from the studios. And uh, I saw Jimmy and his wife. And um, Dawn had never met Jimmy. And so brought her over. And, and uh, we, we were talking for a while. And all of a sudden, uh, it, uh, Bobby, you know, the funny laugh he kind of had. He kind of he, he chuckled. And, I, and he said, you know, you're the only guy that ever did that. I, I, thought, I said, did what? What did I do? He said, well, remember in... When you first came down that spring, that, that we started combining a, a, a lot of the exercises and things. And I said, yeah, I do. I, I said, I do it every day because it's mainly bread and butter stuff. And at the end of part two, you go into the high range. Well, high range is there. Um, and I said, I, I, and I, I've been giving it to uh, a lot of my students. Uh, now, is that okay with you? Uh, he said, of course, whatever helps. And I know, you know, that sounds like him too. I mean, oh, just, absolutely. He was so cool. He was just uh, so he was. and giving. 
Yeah, and it was just, uh, and I, 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 I was relieved because my students loved it so much. And I also showed them all of the mimeograph copies I had of everything. Uh, but I, I would show them this and say, okay, here's the thing you can do as well. Uh, but I, I thought that summed up Jimmy in so many ways. Uh, of course, whatever helps. Yeah, he and was all great part at, of he could do to help. He was great at making, I mean, me, I was in high school when I took my first lesson from him still. And um, he was just really great at making everybody comfortable all the time. Yeah. So, hey, I know we're, we are running out of ta- time here. Uh, I think Paul's got one last last uh, maybe question for you because we've had a few other, uh, we, have a, we have a lot of questions that come up in our groups and we uh, like to touch on different things. So why don't you throw this out, Paul? Sure. Well, we had a, a recent question asking about um, just confidence and uh, like psychologically getting freaked out about uh, first entrances coming in uh, accurately. So I'm just wondering if you can, you know, offer any advice for uh, for those people that are are maybe a little hesitant, like they take a breath and then, ah, am I going to miss it? Am I going to come in? Am I going to clam it? What's going to happen? Um, you know, any offer uh, advice there you can give us? Well, the first thing is that whatever is in your mind is going to come out the end of the bell. So it's 90% of playing the trumpet is in is in your mind. The other 10% is just hard work. Oh, I thought you were going to do like a Yogi Berra. 90% is in your mind and the other half is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. No, but it really is. 90% of playing the trumpets in your mind. The first thing is that the advice I always got from my teachers is if you can't hear it, you can't play it. Uh, and so this is where ear training and theory class, this is where um, uh, ear training playing, uh, doing the mouthpiece practice without, you know, the horn. So that as you're breathing in, you hear the note that you're going to play. Now, quite oftentimes that comes from repetition, but it also comes from uh, working on your ears, like give yourself a pitch and begin to, um, sorry, my focus, my phone is, uh, give yourself a pitch and then sing a phrase. And the way to start there is to, uh, even before you do that, be, uh, learn to hear intervals. Uh, play a note on the piano, sing the note. Play, uh, sing a fourth above it. Uh, learn how to sing fourths, you know, uh, uh, perfect intervals, then major intervals, minor intervals. So you're really working on your ears. And then when you go to the instrument, this is where the triggers come in. And I think it's so important that as you're breathing in, you know the sound you want and you hear the pitch uh, in your mind, because then the trigger is, and for me, it's always a matter of the gum line and, and not pushing there, but just as a focal point. And I, then I think ah and sigh, and then just connect air to sound and just think connect air to sound. Because if you're, if, if you're hesitating, you're hesitating because you have questions, you have doubts. Um, and this is where in your thinking, like if you have to come in on a high note, say a high C, if you think, boy, I hope I hit that high C, good luck. If you constantly in your practice, you think this is how I want that high C to sound. That's a different way of thinking, which brings me to a thing that my teachers also always said. They said, never practice, always perform. You're in that mental state of you're sitting on the stage and you've got to play that high C. Well, when you're sitting in your practice room, if you're thinking, okay, this is how I want that high C to sound, you're saying to your body, not, gee, I hope we get that. The body tenses up and you stop the air and everything. In your mind, this is how I want it to sound. And if it doesn't sound that way, you say, no, I want this to be easy. I want it to be flowing. I want it to be my sound. I don't want a high note to sound any different than two octaves below. My sound. And then, of course, you get the equipment and everything that will help you with that. But it does come back to the initial trigger. For me, as I said, the gum line on side that relaxes the mask. Uh, and then it's just uh, sucking back uh, up, you know, whatever you're, whatever you're thinking. But connect that air to sound. Uh, in your practice, which should be performing, 
And then what you're doing is you're setting the habit. So then you will try it out in performance, in rehearsals and concerts, in a situation that is safe, uh, you know, uh, you feel secure. And then gradually you'll realize, you know, when I do that, it works. And then you'll begin to have confidence in doing that. And then, you know, as I said, we, we'll start to do more of what I feel is the most important thing that we need to do, which is just get the heck out of our way and and then become, become the artist, become the musician. Uh, but how you do it, I, uh, uh, when I've done, uh, uh, you know, conferences and master classes, a lot of times you, you get that kind of odd question, well, what is your philosophy of trumpet playing? And my philosophy of trumpet playing is very simple. Find what works for you and practice. And then never practice, perform with the triggers, but in a setting that you're thinking all the time, this is how I want it to sound. And then you just connect that air to sound and you find that you stop doing funny things because it's all in the mind. It's all, well, you know, I, huh? I was going to say, absolutely. I read a, another interesting statement from Bill Adam, another mm -hmm. great teacher, right? And um, mm -hmm. his thing, they were talking about, <clears throat> it, about hearing yourself or when you're not playing well. He says, if you're not playing well, mm -hmm. you can always change the record. Yeah, exactly. And Hear thought, what you want to sound like. Yeah, I thought that was just a great way of, of saying that. You know, I just want to ask you one question here uh -huh. uh, to finalize things. But tell tell us, like, I have not heard about this gum line um, focus. Tell us a little bit about that. What are you thinking about and, and the purpose of it and all of that? Well, the, uh, I came to that with my first teacher, Mr. Resch, who would always say, okay, mouthpiece and then... And I realized that when I was aware of the gum line, it was a focal point that everything could could absolutely grip around. And are you talking about like the gum right where your teeth, right where they meet your teeth? Yeah, right, uh, uh, right where the teeth meet the gum. There's that little ridge. Right. Okay. But that's normally where we all play. I find as long as I I, I think about the gum line, uh, I I don't put it there or push in. I'm just aware of it that everything feels very comfortable. As soon as I take it off the gum line, and I've demonstrated this uh, to students with the mouthpiece, everything changes. And the horn, the same thing. And it's just a way of saying, okay, I'm aware of it. Then everything else will grip around it so that there's a gum line. And then the embouchure, the body knows how to do this. Your, your embouchure will set naturally. It just, everything is right there. And so it gives you a, a quick trigger. Well, that's that's really cool. I'm going to have to play with that one a little bit myself. Well, thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with us. It's been so enjoyable and it's been an absolutely fascinating interview for me to hear you speaking uh, about all this stuff. Well, Bobby, thank you. And Paul, thank you so much for, for having me. I've, I've enjoyed it so much. And uh, if I can ever help in the future or uh, any further questions that come up, just let me know and I'll be happy to, uh, you know, help in any way I can. Wow, Absolutely. Thank, you. thank you so much. We'll have to bring you back for part two. That sounds like fun. All right. Thanks, thanks a lot. We sure appreciate okay. it. All Take right. care. Thanks, Boyd.